The aviation industry is in effect creating an artificial demand. Only 15% of the people in this country take 75% of the flights. This is not even about business people flying. This is about the very rich people flying away for a number of leisure breaks each year. That's what's driving the growth. It's not ordinary people. It's not even business. It's not people flying occasionally back uh, to see their, uh, their family and friends uh, in Africa or India. It's the very wealthy flying a lot. And interestingly, the research shows that the places the very wealthy most often fly to are tax havens. That's what's driving this. Only 5% of the world's population has ever been on a plane. So aviation is actually very unjust. You have a small part of the world population based in mostly the global north, upper and middle class, who believe flying is totally normal. And others bear the consequences, mostly people in the global south who are already affected by climate change impacts. We don't only have the problem with CO2, there are other climate harming substances like water vapor. Emissions are emitted higher, so they have a larger impact. There's um, the impact of clouds being created. If you calculate the other climate impacts that aviation has, you actually have to take the factor of 2.5 and multiply it. Currently, aviation is responsible for 5% of the human-induced climate warming impact. And if it would be considered as a country, it would be one of the 10 top polluters. Local people have to leave their land for airports who are being constructed. We have the noise issue, the health issue, the biodiversity loss. A lot of big NGOs are not really treating the topic of aviation. Green Party voters, actually, in Germany, um, are the ones that fly most, more than any other voters of other parties. It's a topic that's uh, uncomfortable mm. for many people. So this is why we are trying to start a global movement against aviation growth and airport expansions. We are having meetings with people from all over the world joining without having to fly in because we're using online conference. Just to recap on the air travel list, these airport-centric commercial and industrial developments, I think what stands out is how they're being pushed by governments and corporate interests, but also how strong the opposition is. This is recent on land acquisition for Jua Aerotropolis in India. We're looking at up to 100 square kilometres, which could mean a displacement of up to 57,000 people. There's a lot of Aerotropolis projects in India. Anavi Mumbai Airport currently looking at 3,000 families from 10 villages in the process of being evicted. And it's part of a much bigger project planned for a 600 square kilometre new city around the airport and at that scale it could be affecting a total of 270 villages. Just in the first phase we're looking at 7,500 hectares, 23 villages affected. Lively group opposing a new airport in Sydney, that's just one of the protests. As usual it's the starting point for a much bigger aerotropolis plan. It's a sort of idealised vision there of what it's going to be like. I mean it wouldn't actually be that amount of green space. Direct government funding of 5.3 billion just for the airport component, all the road expenditure. So it's absolutely enormous. Another big project in Australia planned for the biggest coal mine, Adani coal mine in Queensland with 1 billion government funding, all the usual indigenous land issues and unlimited water. This is where the airport comes in because here's the mega project complex with the mine, the port, the roads, etc. And part of that is an airport specifically to serve the mine. Recently, two councils, even though there's austerity, committed 31 million in council funds for the airport. And there's been a lot of protests specifically around this. National Day of Action against Adani, 20,000 people from around Australia participated on the 7th of October. <laughs> Thank you.
in the Maldives, there's an airport project which will actually distract um, mangroves, one of the most important ecosystems, providing also help against floods and risks that are actually increasing with climate change. That's the mangroves that are imminently going to be destroyed. The pre-construction work has started without the full environmental impact assessment process. It's a triple whammy for the climate because you've got the aviation emissions, you've got the loss of the mangroves, which um, are very important for carbon sequestration as, as well as biodiversity and, and livelihoods as well. Increasing the risk of tsunamis is part of it. There's an airport close by, just 30 minutes from there, and it's an international one. Another example of where an airport is one of the initial components of a fossil fuel mega project. So this is in Bangladesh, you've got Mongla Port Road Export Processing Zone, and just to the north of that, You've got the Rampal power plant, which is also in a mangrove area. There's been a lot of opposition to that. So again, we see that in the early stages of the project, they want an airport specifically to serve the port and the coal mine, with residents of nine villages fearing the loss of their homes and their livelihoods. La lucha sigue hasta la victoria, ni un paso atrás. The new Mexico City International Airport is planned with six runways just from the beginning. Lots of local farmers will have to leave the lands. We see um, very serious uh, devastation of all this area outside Mexico City. There are official reports of economic problems. They are signing credits with foreign banks in dollars. We are not sure they will finish this airport. Most probably we will see the money just uh, disappear and also our natural resources. International aviation has wiggled its way out of the Paris Agreement and is delivering its own climate solutions. In 2016, the UN Body for International Aviation, the International Civil Aviation Organization, decided they will grow in a carbon neutral way after 2020. The problem is they are planning indefinite growth. Aeroplanes are not in the same situation as cars, where you have got the possibility of electric uh, motor cars replacing petrol burning ones. Um, Anything like that in terms of aeroplanes is somewhere way over the horizon at the moment. To achieve this supposed carbon neutral growth, they just do it by buying their way out. They will buy offset credits from projects in the Global South, projects that supposedly save carbon emissions, but in reality they mostly don't really save carbon emissions and they are often very harmful actually for the local environment and for local people. It can be monoculture plantations, it can be RED plus, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. It's a program that's being introduced in almost all countries of the Global South. It's a form of protecting the forest in a very restrictive way for locals so that they can't continue with their traditional use of the forest. This is just one type of offset projects. It's also hydroelectric dams, it can be mega dams, it can be cleaner coal power stations with some more filters in there. People in the Global South have to reduce their already very little emissions so that other people in the Global North can continue to fly or can fly more. It's a very new colonial logic. It's also that they want to use more and more agrofuels um, to substitute uh, the fossil fuel, kerosene. They say they're not accelerating climate change because it's renewable energy. Well, biological carbon from wood has just as much capacity to accelerate climate change as every bit as destructive as coal. This is like very large-scale monocultures we are basically talking about. Monoculture tree plantations have a lot of social and environmental impacts. Compared to other ways of using land, they provide very little employment. This is Portugal. This is Europe. Almost 100 people died here this year because of monoculture tree plantations. We are here right now at the COP23 and actually um, all the delegates are being told by the UNFCCC, by the UN body for, for climate change, 
that um, they should fly in, in in a carbon neutral way and that they should offset their emissions. And I was fascinated because five of the biggest biomass plants of Chile are offered as compensation. There's a massive opposition throughout Chile against you know these biomass plants and especially the whole monoculture tree plantation model that is devastating Chile. And it's particularly devastating for indigenous people's lands. Mapuche human rights defenders in Chile have been killed in the past decade. They've been resisting the forestry companies that have been taking their land and they've been killed off. That's the carbon offsets that you can get to offset your flights to Bob. The only way to solve this is reducing air travel. It's not building new airports. Climate change is a trade union issue. Our obligation as a union is to defend the jobs and conditions of all of our members. So we're attempting to reconcile our union obligations with our obligation as a union organised in a major polluting sector like aviation with our obligations to the environment. It is impossible to reconcile, in our view, expansion of aviation and attempt to meet the climate targets. The additional emissions that the Heathrow Consortium acknowledge will be produced as a result of a third runway at Heathrow. When we've challenged them directly, they've simply said, oh, well, those will be offset by corresponding reductions in other sectors of the economy. And when we've asked the consortium, well, what are those sectors and what mechanisms are in place, they're unable to provide any serious answer. Certainly the job claims are inflated, but many of the jobs will be in privatised areas, low skill, which will pose a big question of union organisation. The idea that there will be a bonanza of skilled, well-paid jobs as a result of the third runway is a myth. Protecting the workers in aviation is no easy task. Like many uh, employers in the aviation industry, the employer will seek to uh, make efficiencies and cut numbers over time uh, to meet the demand for profits from the airlines and other interested parties. Um, as a result of that, um, people are worried about their jobs, so they see the addition of the third runway as a way of producing more jobs and then even if there are efficiencies then it's possible they will achieve a level of security from that. If you go to an airport now you're putting your passport on a reader, you're not handing it to a person at the moment so that is the kind of threat that automation poses to those jobs anyway so we think we actually need a whole integrated transport policy so all the different modes of transport work together. You're actually thinking about the whole service that you're providing to the public and how can you do that. If it's publicly owned then you don't have the same commercial pressure to reduce numbers all the time so that means job security uh, and you can employ the number of people you need to provide a service to the public and to do it in a, an environmentally friendly way. What it means in simplistic terms is that you're putting our jobs into a pot which says these are tr workers in the transport area, we adopt the modes of transport that are the least environmentally damaging then that links up with other areas like education, training, making sure we've got the people to do those jobs training people who are in certain jobs to do other jobs if that's needed. You can't just do it by action within the aviation industry alone. What you can do though is try and address some of the issues internally, say domestic flights and near uh, Europe where you can go by train. Night trains apart from improving the tracks for the day trains would be an alternative for flights. If you have a night train you will save three, four, maybe five hours of travel time if you only count the hours. But if you take into account that uh, you will not waste your time on board of a night train like you do if you wait at the airport for security checks and if you may not use uh, laptops on the plane and so on, then night trains will save you one whole day. And the very lack of night trains is, is one reason why people take the plane between Berlin, Frankfurt, Berlin, Cologne or Cologne and Paris. And these distances, 700, maybe 1000 kilometers, you can easily replace planes by night trains. If there was a fair tax on the aviation industry, that would curb the demand, and the research shows that would probably curb the demand enough so that no new runway was required in London and the South East. Airports receive loads of subsidi subsidies, the airlines do, the aircraft producers do too. Apart from Munich, Frankfurt and Düsseldorf, 
no German airport can be run without subsidies. In terms of air passenger duty, that's never fulfilled its uh, original intention, if that was its intention, to, as, a, as a carbon tax. I mean, we'd prefer to see something that's directly related to the amount of flying people do. Around 50% of people in the UK don't fly at all in a given year, and so for those, at the upper end, the idea is to put the tax on those fourth and fifth and sixth flights. We want uh, a system of night trains, we want a good booking systems for trains. We want to show that actually slow traveling might be really nice. Heute ziehen wir hier am Flughafen die rote Linie und sagen Stopp! Kein weiter wie bisher! Es ist zu spät, jetzt noch in veraltete, emissionsintensive Infrastruktur zu investieren. Stopp die dritte Peste! In Vienna, a third runway is going to be constructed if we don't manage to fight it effectively. We had a very huge success in February 2017, where the court actually said, OK, the runway cannot be built because um, it would cause too many greenhouse gas emissions and because it would destroy too much fertile land. We had made actions to say exactly that this is the reason why we don't want this runway. We also work together with civil initiatives of people living close by the airport or being affected of noise issues because it's very close by the city. This was a huge success, but it was turned down by the next court a couple months later. <laughs> When we won the Heathrow campaign in 2010, the aviation industry were in shock. They never in the UK had had such a big reverse as that. They came back making the argument that for economic reasons, we needed a new runway in the southeast. They were very clever not to say, we definitely need a third runway at Heathrow. Then the mantra became not should there be a new runway, but where should it be? So they changed the narrative very cleverly compensation for people losing their homes is probably the most generous ever offered in the UK. There have been talk for residents under the flight paths that they'll reduce the number of flights at night and they spent a huge amount of money in advertising to change politicians' opinions and to change the climate of opinion. On the London Underground alone, Heathrow spent £17 million. Put all those things together and we found it very hard to counter. Nantes is a tremendous victory. What we saw here was a campaign that 10 years ago was, they would admit, struggling a bit. And what they've been able to do over the last decade is turn that small campaign into one of the biggest environmental campaigns in Europe, fighting with direct action campaigners, with workers from a radical perspective, not just saying we don't want an airport in Nantes, but highlighting all the strong environmental arguments against the sort of growth the aviation industry wants. For the people to have won in Nantes sends a tremendous signal to the rest of the movement. If they can win there, we can probably win anywhere. And if we can build on Nantes, we can counter any feeling that the industry will have if they get Heathrow, that they can carry on building at will.